years ago, the Philadelphia 76ers go-to guy was Dr. J. Two weeks ago in Spartanburg, the Miss South Carolina pageant's go-to judge was Dr. J. You'll meet him coming up next on Carolina People. Good morning. Welcome to Carolina People. This morning we're in the lobby of the Spartanburg Memorial Auditorium in Spartanburg, South Carolina. We're focused on the Miss South Carolina pageant, which was held here a couple of weeks ago. And we're visiting with one of its judges, Dr. Adrian Johnson, the Associate Commissioner of Accreditation at the Texas Education Agency. Good morning, Dr. Johnson. Good morning, Greg. It's great to be back. Do we need to go with Dr. Johnson, Dr. No, J, Dr. or is J Adrian works okay? Sometime. Yeah, yeah. You bet. I love Adrian it. Adrian is wonderful too. Adrian is probably something you've heard for many years. Well, my mother was very proud of that name, and so uh, <laughs> she came up with it after my dad had been out at a ball game back in 1955. I'm about to date myself. <laughs> he had taken some students to the game, and he made a bet with the young men about the football game. And the team that he bet on had a quarterback named Adrian Burke. Oh, come on. And they won the game. And he was so excited by the time he got home. And, of course, he had to rush my mother to the hospital. And the next thing you know, they're waking him up in the hospital waiting room. He said, what are you going to name your son? Right. All they could think of was that great quarterback, Adrian Burke. You are kidding. <laughs> I kid you not. That is amazing. What yes. a great story. And he was able to convince his wife that this was the right thing. Well, my mother had Cheryl Ann. So since I turned out a boy, Adrian Burke was a pretty <laughs> so easy So he sale. was the boss on that decision. <laughs> yes. yes. That's hilarious. Well, it's great to get you out. And that was in Texas. Yes, sir. So you uh, not only are, have, are deep into your career now in Texas, but you actually were raised in Texas. Well, I was born and raised in Texas and actually on a farm in Texas. I grew up in the country. Uh, the place, closest place I describe it to the people here in South Carolina is if you know where Dallas is in Fort Worth, I'm about 60 miles south of them, a little town called Corsicana, and about 20 miles west of Corsicana, in a little community called Brushy Prairie. Brushy Prairie? Yes, it was a family community. My grandparents, aunts and uncle, and then we had a farm there. And Greg, I went to a high school called Frost. Oh, come on. Yes. Frost and Brushy Prairie. Yes, we were the Frost. Our oh, mascot Lord. was the Frost Polar Bears. The Dave Thomas probably would have loved that. <laughs> yes. He would have loved to get yeah. down there with his Frosties. Frost, yes. polar, Frost bears. polar Bears. In the heat of the weather, the, how the heck did that happen? Well, it was one of the places that has frost on the water tower year-round. So right. it was just a farming community, cotton community from years back. And, uh, but the polar bears, the polar bears in Texas? Yes. As a matter of fact, if you check the yearbook in 1973, I was named Mr. Polar Bear. Oh, come on. Yes, sir. Now, yes, that sir. is something these contestants a couple of weeks ago would have loved to know about. Well, you. we don't need to tell them everything. I think I'm going to call uh, our head judge, who's also who's an Oklahoman, but spends yes. a good bit of time in Dallas, not far. Right. Now, the Texas Education Agency, is that in the center of the state? Is that it's in, in Austin. It's, it's located in Austin. Austin. I've been there for two years, worked with some great leadership there uh, with the Commissioner Scott and Commissioner Neely. They were there while I was when I was first appointed. Right. But I work in the Division of Accreditation, and we help monitor the performance of schools throughout the states and charter schools. A thousand and thirty three districts and a hundred and ninety four charter, charter schools. schools. And the charter schools are still growing and the district numbers fluctuate from year to year because right. of consolidation sure. and then the growth of additional areas. But yeah, we have a, a large staff that monitors the performance of school districts where there's performance monitoring how they're doing their special program areas or assessing whether they're established as uh, financially solvent school right. districts and right. charter schools. So generally, if there's a problem with the school district, we're the division that looks to assess the type of problems they're having. We think about the number of students, let's say, in the school system in, in South Carolina or in North Carolina in our viewing area. The number of students approximately in the state of Texas would be in the... 4.6 million. Oh, around. come on. Yes, yes. That's more people than in many states. Well, Texas is very, very large, and right. uh, one of the challenges of coming to a place like South Carolina, especially if you're driving, is just to get out of Texas. Right. It's such a large area, and we have such a diverse population, but we still learn a lot from the educational systems around the country, right. and we think a lot of the Carolina systems as well. Oh, absolutely, Adrian. It was amazing being with you here a couple of weeks ago and to see the caliber 
of some of the young ladies co performing here, com competing. Oh, I've been very impressed, was very impressed with the caliber of, of the contestants right. that performed here a couple weeks ago. And it's indicative of the type of people that I, you find in South Carolina. And also, i got to tell you, I'm impressed with the, the spirit of volunteerism oh, yeah. that was so evident here. Oh. Not only the individuals, but the community, the businesses, the industries that come out to support these young ladies. And we can also add the young men now being oh, included yeah, in this right. pageant. And so that is really remarkable. That. A lot of us can know that at our age, that if it wasn't for only our parents, but others who came to help us, who volunteered their time. Right. Growing up in the country, the 4-H program was huge oh, yeah. in helping my development as a, as a young man. And that was community members, similar to what I saw here, coming in and supporting effective organizations that help the parents in raising their children. Well, seeing, of course, your career, having started as a teacher, having later become a principal, uh -huh. clearly growing in that, and now being a very uh, recognized administrator throughout the state, to think about that, those roles obviously change over time. As you think back yourself on some of the teachers uh -huh. who impacted you, whether it was somebody in 4-H or a teacher uh -huh. throughout the school, were there ever some impacts of somebody who said you can do it, Adrian, other than your parents, as you said? Well, I'll, I'll have to throw the parents in there because both of my parents worked in the school system. Is my dad uh, was a bus driver, maintenance man, and custodian in the Frost School System right. for nearly 40, for 40 years. And my mother taught school in the Frost School Is System that for 40 right? years. So my mother was my first grade teacher. Oh, come she on. She was my first teacher in life and my first teacher in the public school system. That's so I can't deny them that recognition. <laughs> but yes, I had some great teachers and great mentors throughout my career right. that it was just kind of given that I was going to be in education. Not that anyone was forcing it on me, but it just seemed natural working with young people, growing up with a family and a surrounding communities and, and the type of teachers I benefited from in my career. Do you remember your first teaching experience going from that role of being a student to later, obviously. Uh, well, yeah, you also know that I, I had a desire to play professional basketball. Of course, I wanted to say that, and, and now I was you waiting. Said. I'm still, I'm still waiting on a phone call. So if I can <laughs> jump up, I may you have to it. go That's and right. see if somebody still needs a 52-year-old to help them in the playoffs. Anything here. could happen. That's <laughs> right. We love it. But uh, I had a chance to work in Austin at the state school uh, for the mentally handicapped and mentally retarded, and just doing Special Olympics. We heard many of our young people talk about, uh, the young contestants talk about Special Olympics. Well, I did that when I first got into my teaching career. And there was just something remarkable about being six foot four and being a hugger wow. as these students with all different abilities crossed the finish line. And I knew right then that's what I wanted to do was to teach. I went back to school and finished my endorsement in special education. Wow. Went to work at Travis State School. But instead of working with the kids who competed in Special Olympics, they put me on a dormitory where the students were basically non-ambulatory. They were in baby beds. Is that they were right? suffering from serious diseases such as cerebral palsy, multiple sclerosis, all different age groups, but basically their life was in the baby bed. And this one child I always share with the audience when I give speeches around the state and the country named Christopher. I worked with him every day and just became very frustrated because I was not getting anything from this student. Right. And a gentleman came up to me and said, Adrian, you have to look at what children can do. Quit trying to work with them on things that they can't do. Uh -huh. Start with the things that they can do. Wow. He leaned over and started talking to Christopher, and Christopher couldn't speak. And all of a sudden, he looked at me and said, Christopher answered his question. I said, how did he do it? He says, he did it, but you have to look at the things that he can do. And all of a sudden, I'm looking at Christopher, and I'm saying, Christopher, are you hungry? And all of a sudden, I noticed that his fingers open so gradually. Christopher, are you ready to work? and then they close so gradually. How do you say yes? How do you say no? Oh, and that wow. kid smiled at me at that moment in time. Wow. And that has stayed with me until this day, that children is what's on the inside that counts, no matter what you see sometimes on the outside. And we saw a lot of unique and very talented young ladies in South Carolina a couple of weeks ago that talked about the inside-outside issues. Right. And that was a living proof of one in my first teaching experience. That is powerful. Yes, it is. I bet we could almost end the interview here <laughs> on that note yes. uh, with Christopher there. And, of course, the gentleman, whoever that was, who walked yes. up and had those words of, right. of encouragement. And so you were probably, what, in your I was early, in my early, 20s? early 20s? Early 20s. Uh -huh. early I, went, 20s. I went straight from college. Uh, straight to Austin and started teaching almost the next day and next week. And then I got into the more 
traditional public school systems, right. working with migrant and ESL students that have different challenges around the state, yeah. trying to learn the language as well as adapt to a lifestyle that required their families to move to different parts of the states and different parts of the country. Right. But yet our educational system needed to stay connected with them as they migrated around the country. And it does. Yes, and, it, it does. and it really does. And that must be difficult at times for teachers to follow, uh, ultimately, I mean, to help pass a student on to another school. Well, fortunately, technology and education are really starting to come together, not only in our schools, but in our country as well, in other businesses and health industries as well, to help us to track students more effectively. And that's going to be a tremendous asset to educators across the country. Right. That right. we can get students into databases where we can know how they're performing. It helps in issues of trying, finding children sometimes oh, yeah. that are missing, oh, yeah. as well as tracking students to know where they are and how well they're performing from the school that right. they were coming right. from. You know, Jack Cooper, the head judge for us a couple yes. of weeks ago here, actually came back last week and was with us Great. last Tuesday and hearing him talk about, for him as a curriculum specialist, uh -huh. to learn about how edu uh, technology can be so instrumental in helping, as you say, oh, to track students on to, and to help the teachers really maintain in the same way Pearson is really able to benefit in a dramatic sense because of technology. Oh, it's, it's had a tremendous impact and will continue to have a tremendous impact on our education right. system because we know the technology we were talking about today will be a lot different three to five years from now. And so that's an exciting time for students and for educators across the country. You know, a couple of weeks ago as we were out to dinner one night, I actually was seated a couple seats over from you but was able to hear you talking about how, as we heard some of the contestants, some of the young ladies talking about how their love is math or mm -hmm. science and how they want to be a mathematician or a yeah. scientist. And to think about that, that these seeds that are planted and hearing you talk about that, share with viewers the extent of how do 15, 16, 20-year-old girls want to be scientists? Well, it's, it's, I, I grew up on a farm, so it's similar to what I learned watching my dad plant crops. You plant the crop in the ground, but that doesn't end. You cultivate it, and later on you find with the proper nurturing, the growth of this plant. And what is what I witnessed a couple of weeks ago is apparent that the people in South Carolina have done a good job of planting the seed to these young ladies specifically, that the math and science careers are out there waiting for them. Right. And so what we, but that didn't start with the pageant. That had to begin when these children were very young. Right. And so now South Carolinians are seeing the growth, the fruit of that effort. And I know some were asking, well, we want to see even more. Well, I'm sure the people in this community and the surrounding communities are doing the same thing with the little princesses right. oh, that yeah. are coming and up. The princes. That's Let right. them know that these are the avenues and the doors that are open for you. Right. You have to work at them. Right. And we have the math and science foundation, so we should see more engineers and scientists in the future coming out of South Carolina and for young ladies across the country right. because we're planting that seed that there is no limit what any child, based yeah. on gender or race, or what they can achieve if they want to work at it. That's exactly. But they have to have that work ethic, and we have to model that work ethic for them as young adults and old adults. It happens not only in the home, but surely in the classroom. As you highlight, Judge Lee, Allison Lee, came back and was with us last Wednesday and hearing her talk about the classroom environment and how so many folks gave her that encouragement there. Oh, yes, yeah, it's, it's so critical. And sometimes, as educators, we don't see what we create or what we have done for a child right. every day. Right. Sometimes it's years later that we hear. I, you've asked me about my rings and my championship rings. Oh, one, yeah. What I didn't share with you, or maybe you may have heard, one of the state championships that one of the teams that I was superintendent of the school district right. won had a young man coaching that was a student when I was a high school principal back in the mid-80s. No, a coach, not, a, not just a player, but a coach. The coach, yeah. the coach of the state championship right. for the two state championship rings I've shared with you right. yeah. was actually a student when I first became a high school principal back in the mid-80s. As a matter of fact, several of the coaches were students. One was even my student A. Brian Irwin was the head coach. Right. Stephen Hell was the assistant coach. And he was my office aide. We used to slip off and go play racquetball during the day during the office period. <laughs> we're getting were, this out, you know, this is on camera. That's yeah. okay. I, I think when you look at the success of these young men and what they're turned out to do, not only for the educational systems and the, and the coaching programs that they've been involved in and the families they've raised, they're quite impressive. So we're okay in letting that little secret out. Uh, but outstanding young men that later on I got to benefit right. from the work that I witnessed and was a part of when they were students. And that's a unique opportunity that made the success we had at Lamarck right. 
the, the mighty the, the Cougar Nation. Oh yeah, the was, LM, which we've seen LM. on your uh, rings right. there. That's mm -hmm. exactly right. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, you mentioned success. You mentioned young men. You mentioned family. We got to say, I've heard you talk about a successful young man who is your family. Yes, yes, I have family back in in, in Texas, and had a chance to come up. And uh, he didn't get a chance to come with me. He participated in the the Miss Texas pageant. Is a that few right? Years ago. Oh yeah, wow! Yeah. I know yeah, he yeah. wanted to be here. <laughs> oh yeah. yes, yes. We're hoping that he's going to continue to do well. Uh, he's been living in Austin. Right. I have a little small apartment. He came down to stay with me until I get my other home sold right. and can buy a place. And he's enjoyed uh, living with me and, and seeing what it's like, hopefully, to be more independent. I love it. Spending some QT with Dad. Yeah, we went on the golf course not too long ago, and the young man, without playing golf very often, can hit the ball, and I just need to get him out there more often because that's a sport that can stick with him for a long time and maybe not be as hard on the knees as right. basketball has been on mine. Speaking of basketball, you've got to share with viewers about the uh, the goal to be a professional basketball oh, player. You uh, actually had that as a yes, serious uh, goal. Yes, growing up on the farm, the, the sound my parents used to became accustomed to was the sound of that basketball hitting the side of the house because that's where the goal was at. And just had a great desire to, to play sports and was fortunate to play in college. Actually, I played in the Lone Star Conference at Charleston State University in Stephenville, right. Texas and was in the top 20 scoring uh, and had some great experiences there. But, you know, God has a plan for us, and we just have to listen and be patient and follow our faith. Right. And as I told you earlier, once I ran and became involved with Special Olympics, I knew that my calling was different. One of the things I want to reach why I wanted to be a professional athlete is I wanted to get paid per, to, to do right. things that I enjoyed to do. Right. And you know what I realized? That's what I'm doing. I love it. I'm getting paid as a professional to do the things I enjoy doing, I love and that's working with young people. So it's the same result, but instead of putting a basketball in the hoop, I'm hoping, I'm, I'm hoping right. that I'm helping students get on the right track in life. Well, a tremendous educator, obviously involved statewide, clearly somebody who had uh, substantial strengths on the court and off the court, but even it was fascinating hearing you talk about if you weren't in education, the thought of possibly being in a theological setting. In a, uh, and I heard you just mention God a, a second ago, yeah. made me think about that, which is pretty exciting. What prompted those thoughts? Well, growing up in the church with my family uh, and being involved in a lot of speaking events, right. I've been asked on several occasions through the lay speaking program through the United Methodist Church right. to d give different speeches in churches as well. I've done revivals as well as substituted for ministers that could not make the service for a particular reason. Maybe there was a reason I had to be out of town. Right. And just, you know, just my faith. And I, sure. I carry that very close and personal, but, it, but it's important to me to share when the calling is there. And right. uh, as I finished my doctorate at Baylor University, my dad looked at me and said, you know, I think going to school for 45 few years now, that ought to be enough. It? <laughs> and I said, yes, I think so. This is the highest degree I can attain. However, I wouldn't mind doing some seminary studies right. sometimes, so we'll see if that's the way I'm guided or not. In the near I, future. I think I heard a little about, is it Emerald or uh, somebody else that you've enjoyed catching oh, on listen, the tube? One of the and great stress relievers that I have uh, learned to uh, use right. the, with the pressure of day-to-day -day life and sometimes with work is cooking. And I love to go home and cook and just try to enjoy the relaxation of putting meals together. So it's been a a wonderful experience, and thanks to Emerald, I haven't done too bad at that area. That I love area. it. Hearing <laughs> you talk to some of the some of the folks last a couple of weeks ago when we were together, and seeing the ladies' eyes light up, and wondering when uh, Dr. J, when Adrian's going to write some of those <laughs> recipes down. There was one in particular I heard you share. Oh yeah, the smothered pork chop, pork chops, and the the beer butt chicken. Now the you can't beer go butt from chicken, the theology yeah. to beer butt chicken. But <laughs> it's only a little for the bit taste. of beer. That's right. That's right. It's only for the taste. Yeah. Right. You know, it's uh, equally amazing to see that you were, as you as you highlighted, when you're speaking to groups, but that you were sought out not only in Texas but throughout the country. I've been go out. To... How did folks find out about that in the first place? I mean, well, how I, did someone I become a highly sought after public speaker? <laughs> well, uh, through networking. I don't. I'm not at the point now. Maybe some other point in my career. I'm planning on writing a book and putting up a website and right. and getting more officially on the circuit, but just through word of mouth. When you do conferences a lot of times right. around the state or different organizations I've been involved in, one, through word of mouth, they would like to have a keynote speaker or someone sure. to come in or do some training. Sure. I've even worked for some business and industries as well right. as right. being an external trainer. 
I try to customize my speeches to what the audience needs and what the company that's sponsoring me wants me to deliver. Mm -hmm. uh, motivational speeches, sometimes dealing with diversity and working with diverse uh, populations have been the two probably priority topics I've worked with around the state and the country, and even spoken at an international con conference as well. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Speaking of diversity, were the polar bears a pretty diverse? Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, of right? course, when I was going to the process, the integration actually occurred while we were there. Integration was occurring while you we were a student at yeah, I, wow. I went to the all-black school right. uh, for the first half of my uh, educational career, or going to school. I, I think we transferred over in the sixth, the sixth grade. Right. And then I did the last half there in the integrated school. And we had a good transition there. We knew a lot of the people in advance because my dad worked in the white school. Of course. Oh, and my really? mother okay. came over to the white school once we uh, right. integrated. We had a guest on the show about six months ago who was not e whose parents were both educators, were both teachers, and, and when the integration occurred, it was a very, very difficult time for her, and they actually sent her off mm -hmm. to school in another state because yeah. it was so difficult as her mother, I think, was championing the integration of schools in eastern North Carolina at yeah. that time. So well, clearly so some areas are potential, mm -hmm. potentially more impacted. So I, I bet that uh, yeah. it could have been a very delicate it was, but uh, the, the good people can get through difficult times if they work together. Right. And uh, w there were good people in Frost that came from all walks of life, all races, right. that worked together to make that count. Now, one of the things that I think is fortunate about education that hopefully will help out as we continue to progress in this area is that we're talking about children. Right. It doesn't matter right. where they're from, right. what color they are, what right. gender they are. We're talking about children. And most people I know have a special place in their heart when it comes to children. Absolutely. That clearly would have impacted you whether Christopher was white or black. Exactly. Whether exactly. he was a boy or a girl. And, and I, when I think of the great teachers that impact me in my career beyond my mother, right. I don't remember them by the color of their skin. Right. I remember by the heart and they touched me in a special way yeah. in a special time in my life that made a big difference. But they came from all different colors now that I stop and look at, back right. at them. That's fascinating. You mentioned racquetball. Any, we've just got a couple of minutes, Adrian. I mean, yeah. you've got to being a highly sought-after speaker, obviously being a tremendous educator, serving more than twelve hundred, more than a thousand districts and one hundred ninety-four mm -hmm. charter schools. What do you do to relax other than cooking? Well, I, I do like to stay active, and, yeah. and one of the things that I am pursuing at this phase in my life right. is to try to stay as physically fit as I can. We both talked about getting oh, up yeah. while we were here last. Uh, right, a couple, couple of weeks, weeks ago, in yeah. South Carolina about getting up and walking, exercising, staying as active as you can. Oh, I try, yeah. If I could learn to play golf a little bit, I'd play golf all the time. But <laughs> the I do phone play, might be ringing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do play golf a little as well as swim, but mostly I just try to walk and stay active right. uh, along with the, the relaxation of cooking and, and taking care of family. So that's, that's kind of where I get my relaxation, but that's staying true. active is important and staying healthy. And that's one of the topics I've used a lot. Is that in, right? In my career as a speaker, is right. you have to take care of yourself. You know, when we get on the airplane, they tell you about the oxygen mask. Oh, yeah. They always say that if you're traveling, like with your small daughter, right. you put the mask on first. Right. That's kind of strange to us, isn't it? Because right. what's our that first is. instinct? Help to our take children. Care. Right. Sure. But the point is, you have to take care of yourself first, then you can take care of your children. If we don't take care of ourselves, you can't take care of your daughter, and I can't take care of the children that I might be working with or my own children. Right. And to, to oh wow, you, you must know your, we just have a minute left. Yeah. Yes, I want to get my clothes in. Oh my <laughs> lord, look at that! I wanted to present to you. Wow. You, you showed me early on this last week or yes. a couple weeks ago that men will wear pink. Oh yeah, very mm -hmm. definitely. And I wanted you to have this. This is comes from a group that I've been working with in Texas, M Industries. Let me hold it up. You I bet. love it. You bet. I love it. And it so says, viewers can see that. It says, okay, of course, it says on the back. Are you, you? And we leave that open for you to fill in that blank. And on the front, if, if uh, you read some of those out. It says, I am a survivor, a conqueror, a determined, energized, a friend. I am saved, a sister. I am alive, awesome, strengthened. I am a daughter. I am rejuvenated. I am affected. Are you? And this is obviously it. a focus on the cancer issues, especially yes. breast cancer. We all have had those issues in our families. And, our, and through education with the number of women I work with through that profession. And it's something that we're very concerned about. 
for all oh, men yeah. and women. Men we have to women. take care of ourselves. My dad had prostate cancer, mm -hmm. so M Industries slipped that shirt up, and I wanted to give you. I love it. Make you the first gift. Well, I will. Uh, I will wear it when I get back to the beach. I would say I'd put it on now, but uh, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, we have run out of time, Adrian. I'm so sorry, and I was dying to ask you what uh, what you miss about being in the classroom. But we're going to have to get you out to Myrtle Beach another time to address our audiences oh, down just, there. Just set that up. We'll be there. I love time. it. We'll make, there's some great golf courses oh, out I'm there. Hurt. Thanks Thank so much for coming in to be with us Thanks this morning. Coming back to the Palmetto State to see uh, the beautiful upstate. It's great to be back here again and I enjoyed it so much and hope to be back real soon. We'll see you. Stay tuned a little more with Dr. Adrian Johnson coming up next. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart. Think about that special scripture. We've heard it many times, and Adrian could have lived his life that way. Dr. Johnson, in his role as a, as a young professional, could have been that way, but he recognized it's not just training up children. He had to learn from a mentor in his 20s. Think about that. Much of his education began in his 20s, not just in the classroom, not just from his parents, not just from some of the amazing teachers but someone who walked up to him as he was trying to educate somebody and he learned from that person. The special activities for us as we recognize that educators are learning in the classroom every day. They're learning out of the classroom and they're often continuing to make a difference day in and day out, whether it's from a classroom setting or just from normal life. Dr. Adrian Johnson, making a difference every day. Thank you. Thank you for having me here.